Good morning. Uh, I just want to first and foremost thank uh, Pastor Brian for allowing me to come and speak and uh, pray he's having a great time in Orlando and that he doesn't get sunburned and that uh, he has a good time. Um, I want to keep you, I'm not going to keep you long this morning. Um, I was telling someone earlier today that when I was in Bible college, they had an old saying. They said, the mind can't take what the seat can't endure. All right? So uh, I'm not going to keep you long. Uh, Father's Day is kind of an interesting holiday. Uh, Out of all the holidays that we celebrate here in the United States of America, less money is spent on Father's Day than any other holiday. Right, gentlemen? You know what I'm talking about if you're a dad. Um, Mother's Day, right? Flowers, you go somewhere really nice to eat, there's gifts and cards and breakfast in bed, and it should be, right? All that's going on, Mother's Day message, praise mothers, godly mothers, great mothers, thankful for your mother, Father's Day, it's like, all right, guys, step up to the plate. Like, you sorry bunch of scum, you know, that's typically how Father's Day is. Mother's Day, it's high praise. Father's Day, it's a kick in the pants. And that's a lot of times what we push on Father's Day. Well, today, gentlemen, I am not going to kick you in the pants. All right? Um, Pastor Brian had told me that y'all were in this summer series. This is great. Big house here that you got built. I actually want to come touch it uh, because I'm just curious. That's nice. How long have y'all had that up there? A couple weeks? A month? About a month? And do y'all know how long you're going to have it up there? No idea, huh? He hadn't let you in on how long the series is? Well, he asked me to talk a little bit about families, and that's what I want to do today. I want to talk about something I think is very important for families. But before we begin, I want to talk about stories. Um, I am not a big reader, I'll be honest. I wish I could say I'm a reader, you know, because when you see people like that, they just always seem really intelligent, and they always seem to know what they're talking about. I'm not a huge reader. I do read. I force myself to read because it's important to read. Uh, One of the other sayings when I was in school is, you are what you read. And so I have to force myself to read. But there are a few books that I read that I love. Uh, One of my most favorite books... Uh, I read it when I was a kid. I used to watch the movie when I, w- with my parents when I was younger because it was one of my mom's favorite movies. But then when I got older, I ended up reading the book. It was Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Anybody love that book? I love that book. It is a fantastic book. Um, Atticus, if I had a son, I don't have a little daughter. If I had a son, I'd want to name, name him Atticus, Atticus Finch. Uh, and so every good story has a couple of things. Every good story has a protagonist. That's the person you need to root for, right? Every good story has an antagonist. That's either an obstacle or a villain or somebody that's against the hero. It's got to have resolution. Every good book has a resolution. Every once in a while you'll find a a good book or a movie that has no resolution. Uh, If you've ever seen that movie Inception, it drives me crazy at the end because the debate on what's really going on. If you haven't seen it, I won't ruin it for you. But some books sometimes don't. But most of the time you need to have a resolution. you got to have conflict. And there's some inciting action. There's something that gets the thought rolling. And to kill a mockingbird, uh, the kids end up getting air guns, uh, BB guns or pellet guns. And so they go out and they're going to start shooting things. And Atticus says, well, you know, you can shoot cans and things like that. But I'd prefer you not shoot anything living. But if you do, don't kill a mockingbird. Because if you do, it's a sin. And over the theme of the book, and that's where the title comes from, of course, but over the theme of the book, what happens is it begins to represent this great idea, this great idea, and uh, it's followed through of innocence and purity, of goodness, that it's something that's good, that hurt no one. And so anyway, when you get to the the gentleman, there's a, a young black gentleman who is accused of raping a white woman, and this is set in the Depression era 30 South, right? And so he ends up getting wrongly convicted. Even though every person knows that he's innocent, they convict him simply because of the color of his skin. And so in the course of the story, there's this whole battle between good and evil and between inside of us between good and evil, and how ultimately that good will triumph over all. And so there's these different mockingbirds. There's the mockingbird, of course, that's the literal bird. There's the mockingbird in the, the black gentleman who is, um, 
who is wrongly convicted. He is an innocent man wrongly convicted. And then there's Boo Radley, you know. He is this young man who's also innocent as well. And so you see this whole progress through the entire story. Well, today I want to read you a story as well. And of course, this one comes from the Word of God. But we're going to do something a little different. We're going to read the story in three different Gospels. You know, I think God loves like a mystery. And uh, he puts the Gospels in there. If God, if God wanted to, he could have wrote one book from beginning to end, you know, like one Gospel that would have contained all the facts about any given situation. But he chose not to do that. And I think some of that is for our own good, causes us to dig in deep, and some of it is to stir the curiosity of the human spirit. And so you have four Gospels. Well, this story's in three of the Gospels, and each Gospel actually gives you a little bit of a different element about what's going on, and together they'll form a fantastic story. So we're going to start in Luke chapter 5. That's going to be the first place we start. Luke chapter 5, verse number 27, and we're going to talk about the call of Levi or Matthew. All right. So in Luke chapter 5, verse number 27... And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican. Now, a publican was a tax collector. It's a fancy way of saying it. And that's what Matthew did for a living. His name, Levi, that would be his uh, given name. Sitting at the receipt of custom, it's like a toll booth, basically, or a a toll uh, office. And he said to him, follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans and others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The first thing I want you to see in here. The one thing that's in this gospel that's not in the other gospels is this idea of verse 28. When God called him, he left all. Okay? So that's the first thing I want you to get. Now turn over to Mark. We're going to look at Mark chapter 2, verse number 13. Same story, and I want you to start reading it and see, does anything different pop out? And he went forth again by the seaside. And all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the seat of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that Jesus, as Jesus sat at me in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What's interesting is what starts the story. This is not in the other two Gospels. You're probably looking through and seeing if there was any difference with Levi, but actually it's what sets the story up that's so interesting. In verse number 13, And he went forth again by the seaside. Now just to give you a little bit of a background, he is in Capernaum. That was Jesus' hometown of ministry. Peter was from there, or the general vicinity. Uh, He lived there, James and John, Peter and Andrew. They all lived there. It's where Jesus based out of. And so he was going around, and every day he would go by the Sea of Galilee, or at least often enough that it's mentioned that he does it a lot. He goes by the sea, and he preaches and teaches to those who are following him. Now let's go to the final one. If you would turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, verse number 9, and this is the last one. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto him, said unto them that they may be they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, most of you probably noticed there was an Old Testament quote fo- followed in there as well. But the point I want to emphasize is actually the name change. 
in Matthew, since he wrote the Gospel of Matthew, he does not refer to himself as Levi, but he refers to himself as Matthew. Now from this, I want to craft a story. Matthew, who was called Levi. So when he was growing up, his name was Levi. What's interesting is the word Levi, more than likely he was from the tribe of Levi. We don't know that for sure, but we're assuming that because he's using a tribal name that is passed down within his particular tribe of Israel. And so let's just assume that he's a Levite, that he's named Levi, that it's a family name, and the name means joined. It literally means to be joined to another person. And it's very fitting, of course, for the tribe of Levi as those that were close to God, those that went into the Holy of Holies, those who talked with God, so to speak, there before the Holy of Holies, that they had this name of joined. And that's what he'd been called his whole life. But the problem is his job. If he was a Levite, he was not practicing that. In fact, he was a tax collector. And a tax collector was the worst person in the Jewish society. Publicans and sinners, they were just thrown together. And when they mean sinners, a lot of times they meant the down and out. They meant drunkards, they meant prostitutes, they meant people who had a hard time living on the street. Those are the type of people, all of Matthew's friends, that's who they were when Levi is there. Now... He's at this receipt of custom. He's at this little toll booth, and he's near the sea, and more than likely he was either taxing people who were using a particular road, which we know about toll roads around here, right? Or he was taxing people that were coming in with a particular quota of fish. As the taxmen, as the fishermen came in, they would get taxed every day on the particular amount of fish that they would bring in. And that was his job. He more than likely knew Peter and James... Uh, uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John. They were fishermen from that town who did that as a job. They lived there locally. He probably met them many times, took money from them many times. He had probably met Jesus before as well. It's not like Jesus was just coming along. And he's like, I don't know who that guy is, but he said, follow me. And I left everything and walked away. It wasn't that way. We know from uh, uh, Mark that over and over again, Jesus would teach right by the seashore there. Now, we read in other scriptures where Jesus would get in a boat and he would launch out a little bit because of the crowds. At this point, his ministry was probably not that popular yet, but this was an, an, an old hat. And you can imagine, there's Levi every day hearing the teachings of Jesus. And Levi was actually called a little bit later because if you look in the book of Matthew, it's chapter 9 that he's actually called as a disciple. The Sermon of the Mount had already been preached. Jesus had really already kicked off his ministry. When you look at those who were following Jesus, Matthew was one of the last people to follow after Jesus. He was one of the last ones to be officially called by Jesus as a disciple. The other guys have been following him around now for at least a little while. We don't know exactly how long. But he had already had this greatest sermon that had ever been preached on the Sermon on the Mount, which is chapter 5, 6, and 7. So here in chapter 9, he hears them over and over. Maybe he heard the Sermon on the Mount. Can you imagine he was curious? All the interesting things that Jesus said. You know, Jesus was someone that uh, uh, seemed contradictory. You know, the things that he talked about were so different than the things the Israelites normally held on to. The Israelites held on to the law that is about what you do. Yes or no, right or wrong, black and white, there was no gray. But you know what? Jesus actually brought a lot of gray, which doesn't sound a lot of Christian. But he brought gray in a way that you normally don't think of because he talked about the condition of the heart. If you think about the Sermon on the Mount, if you hate someone in your heart, then to God you've already committed murder. Now maybe you haven't physically committed it and done the act, but that was a very challenging statement to the Jewish mindset because it never had anything to do with the heart. It was only about what you did. And so here's Jesus saying these things, you know, to lose your life, you know, you'll gain it. Those type of things are very challenging. And so there he is, a man who doesn't belong, doing a job in which everyone hates, and over and over again he hears this particular call. Now the idea of him leaving all, that was the other thing that we got from one of the Gospels. That was so unique. You know, most of the time, I've been in church my entire life, and I'm going to tell you something that I never knew. I went to Bible college, I went to church my whole life. I'm not a rocket scientist, all right? I'm not saying I'm the person who came up with this. It's always been there, but for some reason, either I didn't hear it or I didn't understand it. He was a publican. 
a tax collector. You know, I used to think, why was that so bad? And then I figured out, I read about why or how publicans did their jobs. You see, the Roman government was too large. They controlled the entire known world at that time, and there's no way that they could keep track of all of that. So what the Roman government came up with is a system of bidding on particular uh, either ports, towns, roads, building projects. So I want you to understand, Matthew scraped up a lot of money. He was a wealthy man. We actually know he was one of the wealthiest of the disciples. He had a large house. He had money. He hung out with other publicans. And so he had to pull up all of his money and he bid a contract. Now, we don't know. We're just going to make up dollar amounts, right? But let's say Matthew gave the Roman government $500,000 to have that particular tax booth right there by the sea. In exchange, Rome then let him, they paid him interest on the amount of money that they secured for him before to run the empire. And then Matthew spent the rest of the time trying to recoup the finances that he already spent. He literally had to make a bid. Usually the contracts for the Roman Empire at that time ran between two and three years. So everything Matthew had was tied up into this adventure into this one little tax booth. He poured all of his money into it. Now you can begin to understand why the tax men were so hated. If someone came up to me and I was simply collecting money and paying Rome, you know what, as a Jew, you're a Jew, I'll tell you what, you didn't catch 15 fish today, you caught 10 fish. All right, no big deal. But the problem is Matthew had already paid for every one of those 15 fish. So publicans, tax collectors in those days, ended up having to squeeze the money out of people who didn't want to. And trust me, as Americans, we can identify. You know, uh, I I cannot remember, I was reading about it when I was preparing the sermon. A huge percentage, like 95% of all people cheat on their taxes. I think the other 5% are liars. Now, maybe you're not a cheat like in the sense of, I'm just going to not declare this a huge amount of money. But all the time, I, I'll tell you this, a preacher's trick, uh, this is not what Pastor Loveless is doing, all right? So let me just preface this right now. But a preacher's trick is, you know, I'm going to go to Florida, and I'm going to go take my family to Disney World, and I'm going to go preach for someone, and it becomes business. But let's be honest, was that a business trip? People do it all the time. We're always looking to get out of the responsibility of the taxes that we we need to pay. It was no different in that day. They had all this pressure and even the publicans in those days would sometimes hire Roman soldiers if someone wouldn't pay, if they were afraid they were being shook down, if someone wasn't giving them the money that they had already paid to the Roman government. Then they would hire soldiers on the side to come and basically rough you up a little bit or put a little pressure on you. And as a Jew, you had no recourse against a Roman soldier at that time. And so you can see how they ended up becoming hated people Levi, a man who wanted nothing more than be to, to be joined with other people. Living as an outsider among his own people. You know what's interesting? He walked away from it all. Now you typically think, man, yeah, I know all the disciples did. Did they? What did Peter, James, Andrew, and John do as soon as Jesus was crucified and they ran away? They went back to fishing. They didn't give up their boats. They didn't like burn them or poke holes in them and sink them to the bottom. In fact, the Bible says they left them with hired men. And at one point when Jesus is like, when Peter's talking to Jesus, you know, Peter's like, man, we've left everything, Lord. Did you? Did you really leave everything? Matthew did. When Matthew walked away from that, he more than likely would never be able to come up with the money again to buy another contract. In fact, what did he go do once Peter, James, John, and Andrew all went fishing? I ain't got nothing to do anymore, so I guess I I better learn to be a fisherman, right? He went with them, because they all went. He literally left everything. I believe more so and in a dramatic fashion than any of the other disciples did. Isn't that amazing? To leave everything behind? 
I struggle so much in my life spiritually to let go and leave everything behind when it comes to following Jesus. Most of the time, I've always let, at least I want to have a little toe hold or finger hold on something, right? You know, Jesus have 99% of me. That's the way I am most of the time in my spiritual walk. But he did. He left everything behind. It was such a dramatic change that after this, he is no longer to refer to as Levi. And I don't know if his name was changed by Jesus or this was just another name he was called. But instead of being joined, the person that was always chasing after, never being a part, he now became Matthew, which means a gift of God. And I believe he thought what Jesus brought to him as a gift. Now the big question, and how does this relate to Father's Day, is why did he walk away from everything? Is it because he had faith in Jesus? Possibly. But at this point, Jesus is not the Messiah to them. And He's definitely not the Son of God who died on the cross for their sins and rose again from the dead. So I think faith would actually be a weak excuse when it comes to them following after Jesus. Right now, He's a really great preacher and teacher. But whether He's the Son of God, that's probably never entered their mind at this point. All the time, hindsight's twenty twenty. Jesus would openly say, I'm going to die, be buried, and raise again on the third day. And then the disciples would get around later and say, I don't know what he meant. Do you know what he meant? They couldn't understand that. So I don't think it was faith. I don't think it was love. I don't think it was something that they necessarily saw in Jesus in that way. And this is what I want to talk about this morning. You know what I believe it was? And this is just going to take a little stretch of an imagination. I believe it was hope. You know, hope is one of the least things we talk about in Christianity nowadays. We talk about faith, we talk about love all day long. But we rarely talk about hope. Now, the biblical definition of hope and the worldly definition of hope is two different things. For example, man, I sure hope it rains tomorrow. That is not hope. You're merely wishing, right? You're wanting something to happen. But that's not hope. That's not the biblical definition of hope. If you were to go and look in the Greek at the biblical definition of hope, it means a confident expectation that something's going to happen. That you know that something is going to happen. That you're confident of it. That you're so sure of it that it has become a literal fact that you have yet seen in the future. It is something so sure that it becomes solid. It becomes something that is strong. It's something you can put your life into. Hope is a unique condition. There was a man named Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl is a therapist, and he came up with a system of therapy. I'm a therapist, by the way, if you don't know that. I'm a preacher, too, but I'm also a therapist. It it was called logotherapy. And the idea, see, Viktor Frankl was a Jew. He was in the Holocaust. He was in a concentration camp. His entire family died. And many of the other people that he knew died. Very few people made it out of the concentration camp he was in. When he got out and he got a little bit older, he decided, why did I survive? Why did she survive? Why did he survive? And why did no one else survive? And he began to do a whole series and he found that those who survived the concentration camp typically had a greater hope about tomorrow. That was the one single defining thing that survivors had in common. Because it wasn't always about who was strongest. It wasn't always about who had the, the, was the strongest or the smartest. It had to do with the human condition of hope. And it is powerful. To have hope is something that sets us apart from all other of God's creations. My dog does not hope. Hope to know and believe about a better future is something unique to human beings. It's in the scripture over and over again. I want you to listen to this. I'm going to read just a few of the instances where hope is tied in. Now, most of the time when we read the Bible, what we end up doing is we end up skipping over things. Like when a letter starts, Paul's like, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what is he really saying? Isn't that what we do? We just kind of skip over. Like it's just like an intro, like dear Paul. It's just kind of a really long one. But we're just going to skip over that. Every word in scripture is there for a reason. You know, every single word. Now I want you to listen to this. Acts 23, 6, it talks about the resurrection. The hope 
and resurrection of the dead. We have great hope that God is going to resurrect us. It is so it is so strong, it is an expected confidence. We're confidently expecting this to happen. The hope of the promise, Acts 26. The hope of righteousness. I'm righteous because He was righteous for me. I'm confident in that. The hope of the gospel, that the gospel good news, the short little story that is the most powerful of all human stories, I am confident that that is the way to have a relationship with God. The hope of the glory of God, Romans 5, 2, 1 Thessalonians 5, the hope of salvation, the hope of His calling, the hope of your calling, the hope of eternal life. Jesus is the hope of Israel. Over and over again, you see this word hope, 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 hope. But yet we never talk about it. In fact, you know, hope is the three of the greatest attributes of your spiritual life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's typically the passage you hear when you're at a wedding ceremony, right? The passage on love, you know. Uh, What's interesting in the King James is they don't use the word love, they use the word charity. One of the reasons is when they were writing down the word love, in Greek there's three forms of love. You know, you have uh, brotherly love, uh, physical, erotic kind of love, and then you had spiritual love, agape. You've probably heard the word a million times, right? The problem is the English language is actually not as advanced as the Greek language. We have one word for love. So, for example, I love Jesus and I love hot dogs are not the same thing. Now, you know that by the context. Surely I don't love Jesus more than I love hot dogs. Let's hope not, right? But the problem is you only have one word. So when they were translating it, they thought we had to come up with a different word. So let's, give, let's put up one that's a giving love. Charity. You give to charity, right? For God so loved the world that He gave. And so they begin to formulate this idea of a giving love. And so that's why it says the word charity, right? And so I'm just going to read a little bit. Verse 4, charity or love here suffereth long, is kind. Charity envieth not, it vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up, does not behave unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, rejoiceth in truth. Over and over again it talks about love. But, and it talks about it being the greatest. But I want you to see what's paired together. It goes on to say in verse 13 of that chapter, Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, the trifecta, and the greatest of these is charity. Hope. It's one of the three essential things in your faith and walk in Jesus Christ, and we only ever talk about faith, and we only ever talk about love. I've got a little illustration that I would like to use. I might have to get this stool over here. I would like this little illustration that I would like to use. And the illustration breaks down, so you're going to have to give me a little leadway. This is not the gospel, okay? This is just the illustration according to Brian, all right? So it doesn't work completely. It doesn't completely follow through. But I want us to understand, as fathers, the greatest thing that we can give our families. I believe the greatest thing that we can give our families is hope. Now, the three great things are faith, hope, and love. If I break this, my wife's going to kill me because this is like, like she keeps it in a box. You know, this is not just in the cabinet, right? It's in styrofoam in a box and she puts it away and it only comes out for like baby showers and stuff like that. So if I break this, I'm a dead man. Now, here's what's interesting. You have a vase or a pitcher. Inside is some water, and you have a cup. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I want to ask you, if faith, hope, and love, which one is the water? I want you to think about it in your mind. Is it faith? Is it hope? Is it love? Now, interestingly, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1, I'll read that to you. I want you to listen. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I personally believe the water is faith. Right? The problem is, though, that faith is not something I can actually give someone. 
Not in the sense of, my little girl is five years old, and I love her greatly, and I want nothing more than for her to know Jesus Christ as Savior. That's my greatest thing as a parent. I never understand parents who are supposedly Christians who seem to never show any interest in their kids knowing the gospel. I just, I just struggle with that. But you meet people like that all the time. I want her to know Christ more than I want her to do anything else in life. Because that is the only way I'm going to be with her forever. And so I want, but the problem is I can't give her my faith, though. Not in the sense that she can take it within herself and my faith is sufficient for her. It isn't, right? But I can do something. I can love her. I can't necessarily, um, you know, the interesting thing about love, I do not believe love is an emotion, even though that's the way we always define it within our culture. Love is not an emotion. Love brings emotions, but love is not an emotion. If love was an emotion, there's no way Jesus could have said, love your enemies. Because if I had to love my enemy, then I'd have to have a relationship with my enemy. Because love is based on relationship most of the time, right? And if it was an emotion, then it w- I would have to date my enemy. I'd have to bring flowers to my enemy. And when they're persecuting me, I'd have to go back in time and think of all the fond things that happened between me and my enemy. You can love someone you've never met. You can love someone you don't like. And if you're married, you exactly know what I'm talking about. There's many times my wife loves me but does not like me. It is not conditional and based on an emotion. Love, young people, love is not an emotion. It brings emotion. When you have love, emotions come forth. But in itself is not an emotion. You can love a missionary. I was a missionary. Um, I could love New Zealand where I was. I could love the people of New Zealand and I've never met them a day in my life. It's not an emotion. Love is choice. Love is a choice. It's an action. Now... If faith is the substance, the water, right? Then, is this love or is this hope? Is this love or is this hope? This is what I believe. Interestingly, I believe that the container is hope. It is a confident expectation in which I can place my faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In faith, hope, and love, love is a choice or an action many times. Through my faith and hope, I can perform the action of love. For example, Jesus says, if anyone gives a cup of cold water, right, to another believer, you're loving him. Because it is an action. Love is a choice. It's it's something that we do. Hope. This, fathers, is the thing you can pass down. I can love my children, I can love my daughter, and she can see evidence of my faith by my love toward her. But the one thing that I can pass down is hope. As Americans, we are very cynical in our faith. We're very cynical in the world. I know a lot of Christians who have already given up and are just waiting for Jesus to come back. Right? This idea that America is too far gone, that families are too far gone, that relationships are too far gone. As long as there's one human being with the power of the Holy Spirit inside them, a family is not too far gone. America is not too far gone. We tend to get in this good old days thinking. You know what? In the past, America had been horrible at times. You know America has gone through multiple revivals over the years? 
over the couple hundred years our country's existed. We've gone through multiple revivals. There's been many times as a nation our hearts have grown cold. And we get into this idea, well, there's no hope, there's no change. It's just, we're just riding it downhill, right, till Jesus comes back. I think the one thing we can do as fathers, the one thing we can do as family, the one thing that you can do as Calvary Baptist Church for here in Grand Prairie is to offer people hope. You know, James talks about faith and he says, I'll, you know, show me, you know, oh, I have faith. Well, I'll show you my faith by my works, right? What's interesting is, do you think if, if uh, let's reverse it. This is my container of hope. How much faith can I put in there? Well, I have such little faith. Well, maybe that's because you don't have a big container of hope. Hope is powerful. Hope changes things. Hope got Viktor Frankl through the Holocaust. Hope is what allows you to get up tomorrow morning knowing no matter what, you can expect a confidence in Jesus Christ and what He's going to do for you. Hope is what allows us to go out in a world, and yes, is America sliding, but it is not too far gone. Maybe you're having marital problems right now. Your family is not too far gone. There is always hope until the day there is none. Till the day you can't make that choice anymore, there's always hope. Hope is powerful. Hope is strong. Hope will change lives. Hope will get you through the hard times. It is the three, one of the three greatest things, faith, hope, and love, and yet we seem to let go of it. Fathers, pass on hope. How much hope do you have in the future? And do your kids see it? Hope is a powerful thing. I want to encourage you to show your family's hope. To show your kids hope. show your neighbors hope. To show the world there is and can be a better tomorrow. It's not utopian thinking. I understand that. But I know that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Therefore, I always have hope. I can always be confident that God is doing... We may not see it right now, but you know God hasn't given up on the world? God all around the world is working in people's lives. My little girl we adopted from China. Right now, there are churches... There are, they speculate now there are more Christians in China than in the United States of America, even though they make such a small population of their, or a small percentage of their population. God is working. He is not done. He hasn't hung up his hat. He hasn't said, all right, let's all just sit down till the bell rings and then let's go home. Right? Hope inside of you is the greatest hope that can ever exist. The greatest hope that talks about, I want to read that list again. The greatest hope that talks about their future, the resurrection of the dead. I, I buried a, a good friend um, two weeks ago, or a little over two weeks ago now, three weeks ago, I guess. Uh, Susanna Daves. Uh, she was a missionary. I've known her for, gosh, a long time, since uh, 90, probably 96. My wife's known her even longer than that. Uh, I know all her brothers, I know her parents, I've been in every one, her, she has three brothers, they're all preachers, and her father's a preacher too, I've been in every one of their churches and preached in every one of their churches. I've known her a long time, and I was very sad when she passed, and man, I was like, I don't understand things, God. She, she was gathering her support to go to the mission field, to tell people about God. She had never been married and was going to be married this fall. It's a horrible story. But you know what? I'm going to see her. Because I have hope. Hope is powerful. The resurrection of the dead. The hope of the promise that what God says will come to pass. The hope of righteousness. We sang that song this morning where it talked about, you know, when the storm's raging. Most of the time when the storm's raging, it's because that other verse where it says, where I fail. Right? But I have hope. He is never going to walk away. 
A lot of times I try to think of the words of songs as they're playing. I just don't want to sing them. I want to think about them. And one of the phrases uh, had to do that um, I've never taken one step away. And I was like, oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> I have taken a step away from the Lord many, many times. But then I thought in my mind, yeah, but you know what? He didn't step away from me. I thought I was walking away from him, but I can't, I can't outrun him. I can't walk away from him. You know, his righteousness... Hope is powerful and strong. Don't ever let it go. Don't ever give up on it. And don't ever underestimate it. I think it's clearly in Scripture linked to both our faith and our love. Through great hope we can have great faith and through great faith we can pour out great love into our families and lives and neighbors and the world. Let's stand and pray. We're going to have a verse of invitation. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just come to you now. Lord, I don't, want to keep, uh, I don't want to keep the invitation long today. I just want to give people an opportunity. If they feel like there's no hope today, if they, they feel like that they can't grasp onto it or their hope is very small, I want to give them an opportunity, Lord, to come and kneel before you and allow you to increase their hope, Lord. Help them to see the confidence that you love them and are for them. That, Lord, you want the best for their life. Even though that may be hard for uh, me to understand, like with Susanna's case, Lord, I, I don't understand that at times, but I do know that you always do what's best. Help us, Lord, to have great hope. Help us to pass that hope on to our families, to our kids, and to let them know that it is not over. That, Lord, you can do a miracle today in the hearts of our nation and in our families and our lives. I thank you for the fathers that are here today, for their faithfulness to come, to model, Lord, what it means to submit, to model, Lord, what it means to be dependent upon you. And Lord, help us that, Lord, as fathers, that we take our job seriously and know that, Lord, lives are transformed by being godly dads. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.